This is uh, the annual, uh, second actually, Statistical Science Lecture, and uh, we're very pleased to welcome Peter Diggle all the way from Lancaster in the United Kingdom. Peter's been doing more than uh, giving this lecture. He's been providing us with good cheer and fun and, uh, and advice as well. This is not the first time he's been to the University of Wollongong. Um, he and I taught a short course I think in 2014, together on spatial and spatio-temporal statistics. Uh, Peter is a distinguished university professor of statistics at the University of Lancaster in a group called CHICAST. It's a research and training group within the Lancaster Medical School, and it operates at the intersection of biostatistics, epidemiology, and health informatics. He's also a director, and a, a new gig for him, he's also a director of training for Health Data Research UK, um, and is an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University, Yale University, and Columbia University. And um, he's president of the Royal Statistical Society 2014 to 2016, um, when I connected with Peter again in Manchester at their RSS. Um, international conference. So where to start? Uh, I've started already, but uh, Peter uh, is from Liverpool, I believe, and um, after his undergrad, um, became a lecturer and then reader in statistics at the University of Newcastle upon time. We have to add that here in Australia. Um, and between 1984 and 88, he was in Australia uh, at the CSIRO. He was a senior then principal, then chief of the uh, Division of Mathematics and Statistics at CSIRO. Uh, Peter uh, unfortunately left us, uh, but, uh, but not our hearts. Uh, he's always had a, a great deal of affection for Australia and uh, it's been a great source for us in Niazra. Uh, in terms of his advice and his, uh, his mentoring. Peter's research uh, involves the development of statistical methods for spatial and longitudinal data analysis and their applications in biomedical health and environmental science. I intersect with Peter on the spatial part and the environmental sciences part and we go back a long way, probably to about 1975. <laughs> <laughs> when we both ended up, we just worked out at dinner last night um, after a glass of wine. Uh, we worked out that we were at a conference for statisticians and geographers in uh, Cardiff in Wales. Um, and I was a, they called it a junior lecturer at the time at Imperial College and Peter was already a year in at uh, New Newcastle upon time. Um, Peter has uh, many, many uh, awards and honours. Um, one really not notable award is the Guy's Medal in Silver in 1997. Uh, in general, the silver is more sought after than the gold, actually. The silver is about this stunning piece of research that you do, and it's, and it's um, it's awarded uh, based on that. The goal is more about sort of long-term um, and continued and sustained um, contributions to the Royal Statistical Society. He served on many panels, um, and uh, including the UK Medical Research uh, Council, the Wellcome Trust, and uh, other things. Importantly, Peter, um, although I don't know how he does it. He's more than statistician, biostatistician, and generally um, an advisor to statistics in the UK and then really in internationally. But he plays guitar and tenor recorder. <laughs> and uh, I understand really, I've never heard him play, but I think if he puts it on his Vita, there must be something behind it. Uh, <laughs> Peter's not one to pad his Vita, so. <laughs> Loves to listen to jazz um, and cooks and, and likes dancing with Mandy, his wife, and occasionally venturing into the countryside 
on his bicycle that he put that it was an electrically assisted bicycle, <laughs> which I can relate to. So, very great honour to have Peter here and uh, to give his talk, his public lecture, which is titled A Tale of Two Parasites, Statistical Science to Support Disease Control in Africa. Um, well, uh, okay, well, some of that was true, and, uh, but, <laughs> but in particular, it's been a real pleasure. This is my third visit to Wollongong, and to meet old friends uh, and you. Uh, it's always a pleasure. It's, it's not only a delightful campus, but <clears throat> for the third time, I've had a very warm welcome, and I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I hope um, that those of you who decided, perhaps it's a bit early to slope off for dinner after the free beer, uh, won't be disappointed by the, uh, the next <laughs> little phase of your life. So if I press this, that's there simply because I'm going to leave the slides here and if people do want to follow this up, uh, it's all based on published, well all except the last couple of slides is based on published work and you can follow it up at your leisure, you know. Um, so Noel has the slides, if you really want them please just ask him for them uh, and if he refuses to give you them just email me and I'll give you them. <laughs> so I want to start by... Uh, telling you what neglected tropical diseases are. And it's very tempting to think that neglected tropical diseases are diseases that occur in the tropics and are neglected. But in fact, it's rather more specific than that because at any one time, there is a specific list of diseases that the WHO in its wisdom classifies as neglected tropical diseases. And the term was coined actually uh, in a very imaginative way by, by uh, a number of real, real pioneers in... Uh, global health research, uh, one of whom, David Molyneux at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, is a personal friend. And it was a, 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 an unashamed attempt to actually counterbalance the, the incredible focus that the world's donors were putting on malaria, and by comparison, the almost complete absence of resource that was going into diseases that, whilst they don't kill very many people, have a really profound effect on the quality of life for enormous numbers of people in the world estimated to be one-sixth of the world's population and if you look at where they are surprise 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 they're in the tropics and of course there's um, f f for reasons that uh, may be more complex than they appear at first sight um, tropics are often countries with very poor resource and so the one-sixth of the world's population are disproportionately poor disadvantaged people in societies whose quality of life can really be wrecked by diseases that in principle are treatable, but on the scale that would be required to resolve them as public health problems, cost more than most of these communities can afford. So that's what we're going to be talking about. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have recognised neglected tropical diseases explicitly as being among the targets for ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all. And so whereas they certainly do want to end the epidemics of things that are very well known as major health problems worldwide, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, they also are looking at neglected tropical diseases. And they're also recognising that in order to do this, you actually need to strengthen capacity. It's not a question of finding a biological solution to these problems. These all have very easy biological solutions. Well, all the neglected ones do. We know how to cure these diseases, and we know how to prevent them if resource was no object. If the, if the will and the money were there, we could, we could combat all of these uh, neglected tropical diseases. But the other thing that's obviously very important is to do capacity strengthening. And although this is a, a, a research lecture, I just would like to say that that one of the things that the CHICAS group is doing increasingly now is actually running short training courses in country uh, where we've done some research on a particular tropical disease where we're ready, willing and able and, and have done so in several cases to follow that up with a training course in the methods all of which are implemented in open source software so that there can be some element of capacity building within country rather than relying on international experts having to fly in, do their stuff and fly out again. Now the other th things I've put in red here are because this is a statistics talk and yeah, the first question that a lay person might reasonably ask is what has statistics got to do uh, with all this? And one key word that immediately tells you that potentially statistics does have something to do with it is risk. And risk is to all intents and purposes a simile for uh, probability and probability is the underlying um, mathematics through which statisticians behave honestly because whenever statisticians statisticians are involved in a problem, 
then one thing you can be sure of is that they will not give you a simple answer. <laughs> what, what they will do is give you an honestly complicated answer. <laughs> and I would rather give you an honestly complicated answer than a dishonestly simple one, a theme to which I will return towards the end of the lecture. So statistics, as I hope to convince you in the next half hour or so, has a role. Now, in order to translate those sustainable health goals into actual scientifically precise problems, you do need to think a little bit about the English language. And that's because when I first got involved in these problems, I was told that our goal was to eliminate disease X. Now, in my language, we have, to the best of my knowledge, eliminated smallpox. No, we haven't. We've eradicated smallpox. So what you might colloquially think of as elimination should actually be called eradication. It's the permanent reduction of worldwide incidence to zero. Elimination means the reduction of incidence in a specified area to zero. Elimination as a public health problem actually is a much less ambitious but still very difficult target, which is to reduce incidence to a specified level in a specified area. And the reason for this is, I think, because it's a very bold person who believes they can eradicate a disease that is spread by a vector unless they can actually make that vector extinct. So however hard you try, there will always be a residual pocket of potential reinfection. And so the public health goal is to monitor levels of disease, do what you can within the resource you've got to the best of your ability and as efficiently as possible to reduce the problem that is set to be that disease. When you get to a point where, to put it bluntly, other areas might have higher priority for your limited resources, you may then monitor less frequently, but you should always keep looking because re-emergence of these diseases is always going to be an issue unless and until, which I don't think is going to happen, you actually eradicate them. So again, we are dealing with uncertainty. We have information that says, in Cameroon, this problem is now under control. That doesn't mean it isn't going to go out of control in the future and we need to keep at least half an eye on the problem. Now, the specific uh, parasite I'm going to talk about as the first of the two parasites in my title is onchocerciasis, one of the neglected tropical diseases. And there's this rather graphical um, uh, quote, which I'll let you read yourself, which is the first report by a white uh, European explorer in Uganda uh, expressing dismay that people could actually live in the rural parts of Uganda in the face of this wretched fly which uh, gives its bites people often and painfully uh, and uh, according to John Hanning's speak makes life rather miserable. Now that would be bad enough if that's all it did <coughs> but those of you who've been to the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva or indeed to one or two other medical research institutes around the world where copies of this statue stand, will know that if people are bitten by that particular fly, and if that fly is carrying parasites of onchocerciasis, co colloquially known as river blindness, then unless that person is treated so that the, they, the parasites can be cleared, then they will mature in the bloodstream, they will migrate to the eyes, and there's a risk of permanent blindness in early middle age. And this statue of a boy re uh, leading a blind man uh, with a stick uh, was a common sight in uh, many tropical uh, uh, poor rural communities um, 50 years ago. And thanks to the efforts of a lot of people, um, mostly not statisticians, um, it's a less common sight now, but it does still happen. And so the aim is to actually get this disease down to uh, levels where we may not be able to eradicate it, but we want this to be a very rare site in the communities in question. And why do I say that there's no problem with this as long as money is unlimited? The answer is that you can actually apply a filaricide, you can actually take a pill that will clear the micro uh, parasites in your bloodstream before they can mature and do any damage. And this pill has been around for a long time. It was originally developed for veterinary medicine it's uh, been used for many, many years. It's generally considered to be safe with no serious side effects. And critically, Merck, just in case you think um, Big Pharma is automatically the work of the devil, um, give the medicine free of charge and have undertaken to continue to give it free of charge for as long as it's needed 
because if you can get to these rural communities and you can treat them with a pill, um, I have to be careful here because uh, the precise regime changes according to re how much money is available, what the priorities are and, and how severe the local problem is. But certainly taking one of these pills twice a year is generally reckoned to be a pretty safe way of making sure you don't get sick. And if any of you uh, have actually come back from uh, tropical holidays, as I have done once, and have been concerned that you've been exposed to one of these nasty things, you may be even given one of these pills. I mean, I have actually taken a pill to make sure I didn't catch schisto after I'd been unintentionally experiencing the waterways of uh, Malawi uh, when there was a minor accident involved. Right, um, and so the pill's free, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is, of course, that you're dealing with vast swathes of relatively undeveloped countryside with very poor communication problems, with relatively, and this is not a disparaging remark, low levels of education and understanding of public health uh, pre preventive action in the communities concerned. And it's a big, big task. And it's a logistically big task. It's not a scientifically difficult task. It's a logistically big task. And uh, anyway, this, uh, thanks to Merck, this drug is used to combat uh, onchocerciasis and it's also used in, incidentally to combat uh, lymphatic fluoriasis, which uh, I won't talk about today, um, but we've also been, been working on. So what's the problem? And the problem is the second parasite of the title. So what you have on the left-hand um, panel here is a microscope slide showing, amongst other things, a very small uh, worm. And these are individual red blood cells, so you get an idea of the scale. And that worm will sit in that person's bloodstream, if you don't do anything to kill it, for a very long time. Eventually, and coincidentally, I think, it will also migrate to the eye. And when it migrates to the eye, it does something rather remarkable. It migrates across the white of the eye, and you can actually see it with a naked eye. And it will give you a fever, it will make you feel rotten. If you do nothing about it, it will eventually go away. So of itself, and given all the other public health priorities in the countries concerned, Lower Lower was never considered to be a major public health problem in its own right, and very little attention was paid to understanding its epidemiology or, or the etiology of Lower Lower as a disease. But a French researcher, Michel Boussinesque, was probably the first to investigate in detail the causes of a rather worrying phenomenon that the previously considered safe prophylactic treatment with mectizan, ivermectin, for river blindness occasionally set up a severe adverse reaction, which is the usual medic's euphemism for something rather unpleasant, uh, which indeed, in several hundred cases, killed the person who'd been given what was supposedly a safe pill. Now, to keep it in proportion, those several hundred deaths would be out of 20 or 30 million administrations of the drug, so in absolute terms, the risk is very small, but it's a risk. And every life lost is a life you would rather not have lost. And also, and I don't want to seem heartless, but from the program programmatic perspective, the real problem of people occasionally suffering severe and even fatal reactions to a drug is that when you come around next year with the same drugs, people aren't going to be too happy to take them. <laughs> so you really have to get this problem under control. And what Michel showed with some very um, careful work um, looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, post-mortem examinations and, and the like, is that the people who are at risk of this adverse reaction are the people who are highly co-infected. And uh, there'll be some numbers later, but just to sort of put it in context, highly co-infected means you're carrying at least 20,000 of these beasts per milliliter of blood, right? And that, that is quite something to see in a microscope slide, I can tell you, right? And they are the people who are at risk. And so if, and we'll come to this at the end of the talk again, but if you could do what you would expect to do if you turned up at Sydney Royal Hospital with a potential tropical disease, you could treat every patient, examine every patient, say, don't worry, you've, you haven't got 20,000, it wouldn't be a problem. But there's no way you can do that in the conditions that you're working in. So what can you do? Well, the first solution is to use a proxy measure for risk. And the proxy measure is something that epidemiologists would all learn in Epi 101, which is that if you've got a condition whose severity is variable and its prevalence is variable, then in places where the prevalence is high is probably where you'll find the people who are highly infected. 
And that indeed is what happens with lower lower. And so the first and more practical solution to this problem was to say, we can't go around measuring individual filarial loads okay, on people. What we can do is rather more easily, cheaply and quickly establish presence absence of infection. Okay, the quantification is both time consuming, expensive, relatively expensive and needs experts, expertise that most people would not have in the field. Simply saying there are some there, yes, no, is easier. So one of the studies that was done was to collect data from Cameroon and to actually look at the prevalence, this is the community level prevalence, of positively infected people with lower lower. And you can see there that this is a very strongly spatially structured phenomenon in which there are clear areas where the reds are the, the very high prevalence areas, uh, the yellows and the, and the greens are a bit intermediate, and the little blue ones there where the low prevalence is. Equally, you can see that it's not, it's not simple because you, know, you sometimes get lows mixed among the highs. You sometimes get fairly rapid transitions. And what about all these areas here? Because we don't just want to know about these communities, we want to know about the whole of Cameroon. So the statistical question is the following. If WHO say that a high risk area in the sense of people being at risk of adverse reactions to the drug is one where prevalence is greater than 20%, where are those areas? And that's the information that we've got to help us solve that problem. Well, we've actually got some more information. But this slide, and I'll show it again without any apologies, is my reminder to tell you that the obvious solution from the comfort of your centrally heated office in Lancaster, which is to say, whoopsie daisy, why don't you go and get more data, <laughs> is to understand that that gentleman on the motorbike is an epidemiologist. And he left home four weeks ago. And he had uh, with him, as he left home, a Land Rover on the back of which was hitched the motorbike. And he was given a route and he followed it. And when the roads gave out, he unhitched the bike and he carried on. And when he found a village, he had to negotiate with the village elder, explain what he was doing, he meant no harm, blah, blah, blah. And he collected the data that you saw on that previous map. So you have to have a lot of respect for people who earn their living that way and don't simply say, I need more data. <laughs> even if it's true, of course. So, why do we need to use statistics? I mean, just at a point of interest, I mean, how many people in this room are not statisticians? This is a very interesting uh, question. Oh, good, lots of you, that's great. Because if you were, we could all go home now and uh, <laughs> you, could, you could take it as a homework exercise, right? So the first question, which is, is a very simple one, it says, suppose you take a sample of people, you, that guy off, gets off his motorbike and he, he, say, he tests 100 people and 50 of them test positive. What does that tell him about that village? If the village has a thousand um, people in it, what does 50 out of 100 tell him about the village? The second question is, would it be helpful to know the village's elevation? Now, Paul, I know, is an entomologist, so he would know why, because if you want to breed successfully as a black fly, uh, what you don't want is a cold night. And in Africa, the cold nights are the high spots. So you do not expect to find these flies buzzing around at the top of high escarpments, so it would be very helpful to know the village's elevation because that would give you some idea of whether it's likely that you'll have a, a high prevalence problem. Know the word likely, you can't be sure. And thirdly, and perhaps to some people very obviously, are there any geographers in the room? Okay, well that's, that's good. Uh, and to some people not so obviously, would it be helpful to know what was happening nearby? Right? So, you know, I, I don't know what's happening here, but I wouldn't mind betting if I went there, it wouldn't be too good. Right? Why do I say that? Well, I have to take you through a statistics master's degree in three slides. <laughs> so if you're still with me at the end of the next three slides, you can appeal to Noel and David uh, for a, an honorary master's degree <laughs> in biostatistics. So statistics 101 is effectively coin tossing, but more important than that. So if I say, OK, I, I've tested a number of people, right, this is 100, and I've observed how many are positive, that's 50, so my best guess is 50 over 100. But how good is that guess? And Statistics 101 will tell you that there's a simple formula you can apply that will say with reasonable confidence 
it's between those two limits. And the interesting and fundamentally infuriating thing about the whole of statistical theory is that this n is under a square root sign. And what that means in plain English is that double the sample size doesn't give you double the information, which is one of the disappointing universal truths of statistics. <laughs> but you can see that would at least say, for example, 50 out of 100 probably means somewhere between 40% and 60%. 50 out of 1,000 probably means somewhere between 45 and 55. You know? And so you can be honestly uncertain about what's going on in that village. OK, well, that's enough of first-year statistics. You've passed that exam. And we'll go on to statistics 301, which is called regression modelling. And so this is for question two. Would it be helpful to know the elevation? Yes, it would. Because lower lower is spread by the bite of an infected fly. And the entomologists tell us that this fly needs warm, humid conditions to breed successfully. So if I can measure height above sea level and I can measure humidity, that would help me to predict what's going on. And I would expect to get a more precise prediction by virtue of the fact that some information is coming from these variables, I'm not just relying on the number in my sample. And the nice thing about that is that elevation directly and humidity indirectly by a satellite proxy can be av made available on a raster scan over the whole globe, and in particular over the whole of Cameroon. So even if I haven't been to the village here, if I know it's height above sea level and I know it's humidity, I can make a prediction of what's going on. OK, so now you're into your honours MSc <laughs> project. Would it be helpful to know the results from a sample of people in a nearby village? And the answer is yes. And the answer is really because of the first law of geography. And the first law of geography is that all things are related, but close things are more related than distant things. <laughs> right? The statistical translation of that is that prevalence at locations x and x prime, two different places, are correlated. And correlated means if I know one, I've got partial information about the other. And furthermore, if those places are close together, and I've adjusted for elevation and, and humidity and all that stuff in Statistics 301, then one's probably a pretty good predictor of the other. Whereas if they're 100 kilometres away, not so sure. Right? And if we've got data, we can quantify that relationship. And that's geospatial statistics. So now you've got your master's degree. We put it all together, and what you've got there is the geostatistical model. This dates from 1998, a paper by myself and two Lancaster colleagues um, read to the Royal Statistical Society the year after I got my silver medal, so it can't have anything to do with it. But, um, but what you've got here schematically is the following. You're walking through Cameroon, rural Cameroon, west to east. And as you're walking along, you say, it's getting a bit hot. It's really wet. Look at all those tropical grids. And we're going... You know, we're going down the escarpment. It, it's, it's really getting quite unpleasant. So you would predict that if you did want to measure the prevalence of disease, it would be going up. Now, occasionally you stop and you find a village and you take some data. And here you've got 30-something out of 100, for the sake of argument. You move along a bit, you've got something a bit lower. Well, remember, these things have plus and minuses over them, so it doesn't mean true prevalence has gone down. Now, remember Statistics 101. If this really is just random fluctuation, we can use our plus or minus two and all that jazz with the square root formula, and we can say, hang on, this point here should be within that much of the underlying truth. And it's not, it's too far away. Now, if that happens consistently, and you know the, the points are bouncing around more than is compatible with Statistics 101, or strictly Statistics 301, because we've got our regression function, something's missing. And the something missing is all the other factors that affect local prevalence. However, a statistician can deal with missing information. They simply use stochasticity or probability as a metaphor for ignorance. And they say, I haven't measured this thing, but I believe it to be there, and I can furthermore use my data to know how important it is. And I can calibrate the deviations from the environmental gradient so that the discrepancies between what I observe on the ground, the circles, and what I predict is close enough to the circles that it's compatible with Statistics 301, but not so close to the circles that it's implausibly close. If any of you haven't uh, heard the famous story about Mendel's first experiments in genetics, 
it's pretty well established that his data were in probably good fit to the genetic theory. Now, he was right about the genetic theory, but some of the data were distinctly suspect because they were improbably close to the truth. So you don't want your models to follow all these fluctuations because that's just random noise. You want to balance it. And it's the balancing that requires Statistics 501. Right. Translate this to lower lower. We have got a random sample of subjects in each of a number of villages. We've taken blood samples. We've got environmental data on a regular raster scan. What's the question? The question is, at each location, how likely is it that prevalence is greater than 20%? It's not my question. And that's absolutely crucial. It's the, the WHO's question, not mine. Statisticians shouldn't answer their own questions. Statisticians' job is to answer other people's questions. Right? That's the question. Now, this is the regression bit. This is the statistics 301 bit. As elevation increases, there appears to be a small increase in prevalence. That doesn't sound terribly right until you remember that one way to get low prevalence, lo sorry, low elevation, is to be close to the coast. And coast has coastal breezes and it has sand and, dry, and the, the flies don't like it much. So this is sort of a byproduct of the fact that the higher um, elevations tend to be further away from the coast. But what you see, and this is the entomology just coming in very obviously, is that you get up to about a thousand meters of elevation, these, these things can't breed. And so you get a, a catastrophic, from the insect's point of view, very good from the person's point of view, collapse in, in the prevalence. And it's a small point to make, but again, that's not my number. I asked the entomologist. I said, what's the critical elevation for successful breeding? They said a thousand. If I did want to estimate that number, I'd be pretty uncertain about where it was. So that's the entomology giving me that functional shape. And then I just fit the parameters within that constraint. In terms of uh, greenness, this is a satellite measure of greenness, it's much more um, standard in that basically the greener the vegetation, the higher the prevalence. But what justification can I as a statistician give for flattening that curve? Answer, none. All right? The engineers who design these indices tell me, and I have to believe them, that for the purposes of being a proxy for greenness of vegetation, 0.8 is saturated. So once it's over 0.8, it's all noise. So why they don't just call it 0.8, I don't know. They give you numbers all the way through, <laughs> but they tell you to treat anything above 0.8 as 0.8. So that's why my model levels out. Right? So I'm combining my statistics with, in this case, the engineering of remote sensing. Now, is, is, isn't Statistics 301 good enough? I can adjust for elevation and greenness. This is what I um, predict. This is what I observe. And the line of equality isn't so bad, actually. It's not perfect, but there's quite a lot of scatter about it. When you add geostatistics, remember the, the dashed line, the curvy line, what you get is the shrinking in. You get a much tighter prediction. And of course, it, you don't want it to be perfect, because it would be unbelievable if it was perfect. But it shrinks in to quite a considerably narrower Scatter. And the end point of this whole exercise is the pink map. And this is not a prevalence map. This is not my estimate of prevalence. This is my probability that prevalence exceeds the WHO's guideline of 20%. So in plain English, red is dangerous, yellow is safe, pink is don't know. And the unfortunate thing about the pink map is that it's called the pink map because mostly it's pink, and that means we don't know what's happening. But we have learned quite a lot from this map. And one thing we've learned is shown very graphically here, which is if the dots are where you've actually measured prevalence, how on earth can you make predictions up here? And the answer is, I have no idea what the true prevalence is up there, but I'm certain it's less than 20%. If the WHO had asked me to predict where prevalence was bigger than 5%, you would not get that sharp result. So basically, the data are pretty good at identifying areas which are fundamentally unsuitable for transmission of the infection. At the other end, the only time you get into the dark reds is where you've got local data. Right? So the environmental variables, statistics 301, is not enough to identify the positively dangerous areas. You need the geospatial element as well. And if you don't have the ground truth geospatial concentrations of data, you get into the pink zone. You don't know what's going on. And that was solution one. That's about, crikey, 12 years ago now. Remember, we can't get more data. Or can we? Some very ingenious people in WHO, one Hans Remmer, now retired, another Ono Razure, still working on problems of this kind, 
came up with this rather beautiful idea. And you remember I showed you the photograph of the worm crossing somebody's eye? Well, that photograph was, was used routinely to see if, instead of taking blood samples and looking under the microscope, you could simply ask this lady three questions. Have you ever suffered from eye worm? Yes. Did it look like this photograph? Yes. Did it go away within a week? Yes. Three yeses, that's a positive. Anything else is a negative. Next. Much cheaper, much quicker, you know, uh, much easier to train field operatives to do. And um, does it work? And the answer is, let's find out. These are locations deliberately spanning the whole of the, you know, the tropical region of Africa, you know, from the northwest, the far east, the southwest, in which we did both. We took blood samples and we asked the three questions. And this is the ratio we found. So this is the three questions. This is the blood test and the different colours of the different locations. And up here they diverge. And the reason is because we haven't actually got a lot of data up here. So our estimation is really rather imprecise. But where it matters, remembering that 20% is the sharp end for the WHO, they're really not bad. So that's pretty encouraging. And you can see, in fact, that although it's quite a good relationship, it's not a relationship of equality. And roughly speaking, the correct calibration would be about 20 to 50, with some degree of uncertainty. But the, the, the signal virtue of this is now you can do that. So these are the places where the field workers were able to go and conduct rat lower surveys. And this is the resulting version of the pink map. So red, as before, is dangerous. Blue is safe. And the zone of uncertainty comes around these things here. And you can see that it's, it looks very small on this map, but of course it's an Africa-wide map. And if you hone in on Cameroon, there's still an awful lot of people living in these places. So it's not perfect, but it does give you uh, a, a first-pass geographical coverage on a much greater scale than would be feasible with parasitology. It's the same basic notion of a geostatistical model, but um, it's using data that can be collected more abundantly, and therefore the predictions are correspondingly more precise. And remember, this is not saying I know precisely what the prevalence is here. All it's saying is that I'm confident it's over 20%. So that's why it looks so precise, whereas if you looked at a map of point prevalence, which I'm not going to show you, it would have a lot of noise in it because we don't know exactly what the prevalence is. Okay, so now we come right up to date. And, you know, a good question in any scientific talk is, how long will it be before somebody mentions the iPhone? Right? <laughs> and the answer is um, about 30 minutes. Uh, because uh, there's the iPhone, right? And this is an invention from California. I don't know which team in particular. I think it's at Berkeley, certainly. And, and what they, this team has done is developed this very compact mobile microscopy that you can take into the field much more easily than traditional kit. But also critically, rather than needing a trained microscopist to read it, right, all you do is you put a blood drop under the eyepiece. Uh, you just check that it's lined up. You press go on the iPhone and it comes back and says 4,207. And what it's doing rather ingeniously is it's taking a little movie and it's calibrating the amount of movement it sees of the microorganisms into an equivalent number per mil of blood. And obviously that's been calibrated fairly extensively and equally obviously, and I won't actually show you this scatterplot, it's not a perfect relationship, but the correlation is certainly northwards of 0.95, except at very, very high intensities where it all goes haywire, which is kind of what you'd imagine. It's not a linear calibration, but it's been calibrated in the labs uh, to, to give a reasonably good proxy for um, intensive infection. Now, this is both good and bad news, from my perspective. The good news is obviously that now you have an affordable form of microscopy that you can take individual communities and test individual people. The bad news from my perspective is it makes people think they've now got the answer. And this is something, and you may agree with that point of view actually, because a lot of people do. But I want to sort of now persuade you that it's not, it's a better answer, but it's still not the answer. And the reason is um, conveyed in this picture here, which is that when we get the, um, the cell scope data, we've now got a response which is either zero, which it quite often is, fortunately, or a number. And if you plot the cumulative proportion of people whose um, infection levels are lower than 
a number, you will find a lot of variation between villages. This is one village, the, the purple's another, the blue, the green, the yellow. But what happens there, there are two important features of this picture. One is confirmation of the original epidemiological hypothesis, that this red village is a village with very low prevalence, because most people get zero, and a very short upper tail. This is a village with relatively high prevalence and a long upper tail. So what that means is that in, there is indeed a relationship between um, the two uh, quantities of interest, the prevalence and the upper tail, the highly infected people. The second thing that's nice about this picture is you can see that although these curves are different, they're all roughly the same shape. And when a statistician sees reproducibility in empirical patterns, they start getting excited and think, I could model that. Because if these curves had just been completely different shapes, some of them S-shaped, some of them like this, some of them the other way around, there's no way we could have fitted the model. So what we did, um, you can see the personnel changing over time as postdocs come and go, um, with Daniela Schluter, now a lecturer in Liverpool, is we modelled jointly over about the 200 villages the relationship between prevalence and intensity of infection. And again, whenever you see a picture like this, what that means is that although you're only interested from the safety point of view in intensity of infection, you're actually getting information about that indirectly from the prevalence. Because if I, in fact, only gave you the prevalence, and I said prevalence was one, by the way, this is a transformed scale, which is why you get these weird numbers. But if you just ignore that for a minute, unless you want to read the algebra, then if prevalence is here, then you'd make a pretty good guess that I don't know exactly where intensity is going to be, but it's certainly not going to be there. It might be there, it's probably there, it might be there, it's not going to be up there. So what this means is that you're actually using all the information about both prevalence and measured numbers to predict the quantity of interest, which is basically how many people are going to exceed a certain level. Now, it's a pity that they've chosen 20 again, because I was talking earlier about 20%. Quite independently, and if you're sceptical about the independence, I can't help you, I wasn't there, People have decided that at the individual level, 20,000 parasites per mill of blood is a kind of threshold that puts people at risk of a serious adverse reaction. So what you want to know when you go into a community is that there are at most very few and ideally no people with an MF load greater than that 20,000. So now we've got the, the portable microscope. We can go into a village and we can test individuals. And what this has done is create an ethical debate. And it's an ethical debate that's been raging for at least a year and has so far not been resolved in, by two residential meetings, one in Geneva and one in Brazzaville. There's a strong lobby to say that the only acceptable way to deal with this problem is test and not treat. And what that means is that you go into a village with your pills, people line up, and they get tested using this thing. It's called the lower scope. All right? And if the lower scope says he's got more than 20,000 parasites per mil, they say, I'm really sorry, we can't give you the pill. Mm -hmm. right? And they move on. Now, that is obviously a very conservative strategy. And obviously, one wants to be conservative when potentially you're threatening people's lives. But the counter argument, and I, I'll be honest, I'm in this camp, is that when you're doing mass drug administration, if you can't give the pills until you've tested everybody with a microscope, you need a lot of microscopes. And we don't have a lot. We have something of the order of several hundred. To do this routinely, never mind the time it takes to actually do it, um, we, would, uh, we would be slowing the program down. And every time you don't treat a community, you are also risking people getting river blindness, which on the whole is very bad news for them. Every untreated village is going to be at risk of onchocerciasis. So if in real terms you slow down the program, there's a cost. And there is no such thing as zero risk. And why is that? It's because where does this number come from? Well, even if it's the best guess, and I appreciate you do have to set these rules so that procedures, operational procedures are clear and unequivocal, it is foolish, and nobody seriously believes it, to think that this is an absolute threshold, that below it you have zero risk and above it you have positive risk. Um, these low scope answers, 4,872, they're estimates themselves. And you should really allow for the uncertainty in those estimates. Now, where does this take us? Well, in two weeks' time, it takes me to Washington, D.C. to do battle again um, at the invitation 
of the coordinating agencies to see if we can reach a consensus on what to do about this ethical dilemma. And I can't answer the ethical question because I am a firm believer in not trying to answer questions I'm not competent to answer. What I can do is provide evidence that might help other people to answer those questions. And the point that I certainly always try to make here is that there is no dichotomy between test and not treat and MDA. It's a false dichotomy. And the reason it's a false dichotomy is that as your appetite for risk diminishes, the two strategies converge. And why is that? It's because, if you think about it, suppose you accept that a village is safe for mass drug administration if fewer than 2% of the population have MF loads greater than 20,000 per mil. And you can replace 2% by any other number you like. And you can replace 20,000 by any other number you like. They're not my numbers. But suppose there's a consensus that that's the definition of safety. You go into the village and you sample some people. And you apply your statistical models and you come up with a predictive probability. You come up with a probability that that criterion is met. Now, suppose you agree an acceptable level of uncertainty and you suppose that your acceptable level of uncertainty is 1%. You're happy to get it wrong 1% of the time. I oversimplify, but you get, you, get, you get the message. Well, if this calculated probability is greater than 9.99, you're happy. So you declare the village safe and give them all the pills. If that probability is less than 0 0.01, you aren't saying it's not safe, and you do not give them the pills. If it's in the middle, increase the sample size. And this is not an unreasonable request, because you're no longer requiring a motorbike to drive through hostile country and village. New vill you're already there with all the kit. You simply keep sampling. And the closer these numbers are to 1 and 0, the closer you will end up treating everybody. And of course, while you're doing this, if you do happen to find somebody who's highly infected, you don't treat them. But the point is, at some point, you will be finding 5,000, 3,000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4,000, 0, 0. And at some point, you say, you know, this looks pretty safe. And rightly or wrongly, Nigeria has already decided that based on the data they've got, the whole country is safe. And so they're now just doing mass drug administration countrywide. A lot of other countries, are less certain, and that's fair enough, because their problem is bigger, their uh, prevalences are higher, so their probabilities of people being highly infected are higher, and they have to be appropriately more cautious. So my prediction is that we're going to agree to be friends and come up with a hybrid strategy. So what we're going to be doing, I predict, and it's only a prediction, is that we'll initially do countrywide mass drug administration, right? We'll have conservative safety thresholds, with the idea that we will only declare these places, certain places safe if this probability really, it might go to 0.999. I don't mind what we go to. It's not my job. I can't answer that question. But I can imagine that in a broad sense, you want to be conservative. And then, where you really are in this, not sure if that's an ethically acceptable level of risk zone, then you do test and not treat. And so you need, and actually, of course, this is what statisticians love as well as trying to do useful work, is they like challenges. And the challenge then would be that you're going to have a hybrid prediction problem, where in some areas you've just got prevalence data, in other areas you've got individual level data, you've got environmental rasters, and you want to pull it all together and synthesize it all to make the best possible predictions you can and answer the relevant question. But what would I like to finish on in one slide? I would like to... Um, I hope you won't think this is like um, Oscar Wilde's famous uh, statement that uh, patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, right? Well, the, the, if you've got a, a statistician who's behaving like a scoundrel, they try to find something said by great people that agrees with what they've just said. <laughs> and, and in this case, I'd like to claim that I've succeeded. John Chukey, sadly no longer with us, uh, one of many things that he said, and one that I think is my favourite quotation, is that it's better to give an approximate answer to the right question than a precise answer to the wrong question. And I would say that answering the question, does the lower scope give a number bigger than 20,000 for this person, is the wrong question. The right question is, is it safe to give this person a pill? And that's a different question. And I, can, I will never, as a statistician, give an answer yes or no to that, but I will give a, an answer that says, within your tolerable stated risk limits, uncertain limits, the answer is yes. And this is, um, this is actually somewhat indirectly, and I, uh, I did 
write this slide a long time before I knew anything about the local plans for NIASA and data science and the like, is this is why any decent university needs a data science institute that reaches out across the whole campus. It's because Sir David Cox, by common consent, the greatest statistician of the second half of the 20th century, and still um, not only with us but publishing papers, was given, asked in an interview, is it, uh, what advice would you give to somebody trying to set up a new statistics group in a university? And his answer, verbatim, was that. But what he was really saying in very, very short language was, go and talk to non-statisticians. The best statistical science is done in collaboration with people in other disciplines. Statistics is an added value discipline, right? On its own, it can do interesting maths. But in collaboration with social scientists, environmental scientists, medics, whatever, it can add value all over the place. But it can only do that if the statistical base in the university is known, appreciated, valued and used and exploited university-wide. Um, and indeed, I almost uh, called this talk a tale of three parasites. Can anyone guess what the third parasite is? Statistics. <laughs> Statistics is a benevolent parasite on science. And everybody needs a benevolent parasite. Thank you very much.